Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 19th of April and a, a few updates this week. As always, you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. New videos this week, so I dived into ExpressRoute Metro. This is a hugely important new capability for ExpressRoute that's rolling out at this time. And to me, it's the equivalent of in Azure, you had availability sets that gave me resiliency from a rack level, node level failure. Then availability zones gave me resiliency at an entire physical facility failure. Well, that's what ExpressRoute Metro does for the two active active connections you have within a certain Metroplex, a certain city. With Metro, instead of them going to the same physical building, now they'll go to two different physical facilities within that Metroplex. So really powerful. Uh, again, it's rolling out at the moment. It's not available everywhere, but it's something I think everyone will shift to as it becomes available in your peering point location and by your carrier. So onto what's new on the compute side. So EventGrid now has a last will and testament capability in preview. So if you think that event grid is that whole publish subscribe message brokering capability that has MQTT support. MQTT is very popular with Internet of Things because it works very well with limited network bandwidth, uh, resource constraints. So what Last Will and Testament lets me do is as part of the MQTT specification, other applications could receive a notification when a client disconnects in a ungraceful state. And then it would enable those other clients to react. Maybe they have to change where they go and get traffic from. Maybe they have to up their scale, whatever that might be. And I can think of real-time communication scenarios. This would be really important that if a client failed, the other clients could find out. So what happens now is when my client connects, it publishes, it creates a last will and testament message. So it publishes that um, as a particular message on a particular topic. And then all the other clients that subscribe to that topic would receive that will message in the event my client ungracefully disconnects. So it's just that ability now that if a client disconnects in a non-graceful way, that will message it published would now go out to all the other clients in that ungraceful disconnect scenario. So that's available in preview. HBV4 and HXVMs are now available in Sweden Central. So HBV4 are all about high performance computing workloads, um, finite element analysis, front end and back end, EDA rendering, etc. HX are about very large memory, high performance computing workloads. Um, so those, hey, I can now go and use those in Sweden Central. On the networking side, so Azure Virtual Network Encryption is now available in all regions in GA. So remember what this does is it will transparently encrypt all of the traffic for accelerated networking enabled virtual machines. It needs to be accelerated networking because that encryption is offloaded to the FPGA in the host that provides that virtual function through which the Azure virtual machine offloads the, the work, bypasses the switch for accelerated networking. But it's then completely transparent, doesn't add any overhead to the virtual machine itself. Um, so now that is available everywhere. And then Azure Bastion Developer SKU has gone GA. So the developer SKU is really this very cost effective SKU geared, as it says, towards very limited scenarios. And basically what it lets me do is I can connect to virtual machines in the same virtual network, and I can connect to Linux using SSH and Windows using RDP. It doesn't let me do SSH to Windows or RDP to Linux, doesn't let me connect to peered networks or more advanced scenarios. But if I'm just a developer, and I just need that fairly basic set of functionality to enable me to go and connect, to my virtual machine via Bastion, well, it's gonna let me do that. Carrying on, Azure Virtual Network Manager now enables me to use network groups as part of my security admin rules. Now remember the whole point of security admin rules is they enable me to create these centrally managed rules that are very much like network security groups, but they would apply 
before the network security groups. So if I think about I have my security admin rules, I can define four sets of traffic. Do I want to allow it? Which means the traffic would flow through and then hit whatever NSGs were on that target. I could deny the traffic, so it will just fail straight away. Or I can do a always allow, which means it would actually bypass the NSGs and always get to the target. That might be useful for me as an organization. I have certain resources that all Azure resources should always be able to get to maybe my domain controllers or patching infrastructure. So security admin rules let me do that. And again, they're structured very similar to network security groups. Think of it as a funnel. It's going to hit the security admin rules that apply first. Then if it's allowed, then it would hit the NSGs. So the people local to the VNet, they have some control of the traffic as well. Unless I just forced it through with an always allow. Well, what I can now do is I can use my network groups as part of the source and destination of the security admin rules. And a network group is just a collection of virtual networks. That could be statically assigned, I just put them in, or it could be dynamic, so based on some uh, conditional statement I define, virtual networks automatically would get added in if they meet that particular criteria. And why this is nice is now my security admin rules don't have to worry about side arranges. I can just say, hey, maybe um, my production network group cannot talk to my development network group. Or my DMZ network group, hey, that's not allowed to have these ports go directly to anything on my intranet. So I can now use those to really simplify the various rules I have. On the storage side, so last ownership update time attribute is now available on disks. So essentially, whenever the disk state was last changed, it will now show. And if we quickly jump over to the Azure resource graph, so all I'm doing here is I'm looking at all of my resources where it's a disk. And if I look at, uh, where's my Linux disk? Yep, if I look at my details, we'll see the attribute. And so if I look at my properties, I can see that last ownership update time, so it was over a year ago. And for example, I can also see disk state is unattached. So what this enables me to do by putting those two bits of information together, I can fairly comfortably say, hey, this disk has been unattached for a year, it's probably pretty safe for me to go and maybe archive it away or delete it. So it just makes it easier for me to now combine with other attributes to maybe make decisions on what I want to do um, with those disks. And Azure Databox Disk now supports hardware encryption. So Azure Databox box Disk is where you get sent between one to five SSDs, I think they're eight uh, terabytes in size. And I can use that to import data into Azure, basically offline, or export data out of Azure and get it sent to me. So normally it's software-based encryption, for example, BitLocker, AES-128 uh, encryption. Now I have a hardware encryption option, which is AES-256, and the performance will be equivalent. So if I do the hardware encryption, I self-encrypted on the disk. On a Linux node, it would be the same as doing that BitLocker encryption on a Windows node. So it just gives me now that option, and it's uh, US, EU, and Japan that is available for. On the miscellaneous, so Azure Site Recovery Update 73 has gone GA. This is support for the mobility service, the Linux operating system. So for Azure to Azure, uh, Debian 12, Ubuntu 18.04 Pro. Um, for modernized VMware, so that the appliance and physical to Azure, again, Debian 12 and Ubuntu 18.04 Pro. And there are a few other little bug fixes. Azure Monitor Workspace, remember Azure Monitor Workspace today is a special workspace we use for Prometheus uh, compatible storage. So now what I can do with the query editor is I can run PromQL directly within the Azure Monitor Workspace to uh, go and get information about it. And Azure Monitor Log Search alerting now supports managed identities, both system assigned where it's one-to-one -one tied with the resource and user assigned where 
that identity has a separate life cycle. So that will simplify those interactions with the log source that I want to maybe trigger alerts from. Note, if I'm using Azure Data Explorer as the log source or Azure Resource Graph, I have to use a managed identity for that to work. And that was it. Uh, as always, I hope that was useful. Until next video, take care.